I'm Leila Saad, and my life is driven by one burning question. How can I become a good ancestor? How can I create a legacy of healing and liberation for those who are here in this lifetime and those who will come after I'm gone? In my pursuit to answer this question, I'm interviewing change makers and culture shapers who are also exploring that question for themselves in the way that they live and lead their life. It's my intention that these conversations will help you find your own answers to that question too. Welcome to Good Ancestor Podcast. Welcome, Good Ancestors. Today I'm speaking with the American novelist of one of my favorite fiction books of 2020, Kylie Reed. Kylie is a graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, where she was the recipient of the Truman Capote Fellowship. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Such a Fun Age, which explores the relationship between a young black babysitter and her well-intentioned white employer. If you're anything like me, you'll find yourself laughing, cringing, crying, and cheering when reading her book as it explores racism in the awkward and uncomfortable ways it shows up in everyday life. Such a Fun Age is currently in development by Lena Waithe's Hillman Grad Productions and Sight and Scene Pictures. The novel was long listed for the 2020 Booker Prize and a finalist for the New York Public Library's 2020 Young Lions Fiction Award, the VCU Cabell First Novelist Award, the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work by a Debut Author, and the Mark Twain American Voice in Literature Award. Kylie's writing has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Playboy, December, Lumina, where her short story, was the winner in the 2017 Flash Prose Context, and Pluff Shares, where her short story was the winner of the 2020 Ashley Leeborn Prize for Fiction. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Good Ancestor Podcast. I'm your host, Leila Saad, and today I am here with the author of, and I know I always say this every time I interview an author, but truly, this is one of my favorite books. Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. I have Kylie Reed in the house. Hi, Kylie. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm so happy you're here. Um, I was preparing for our conversation today earlier, and I was like, wow, it's really, you know, you set the intention. I was reading your book earlier this year, and I was like, I have to interview her. Like, I have to dig in. I have to know. So it's it's such a delight to have you here um, in, on the show with us. And it's been a big year for you. So where how are you now? Where are you at the moment? Are you? <laughs> at home, I am in Philadelphia. And as you can probably see, I mean, there's two good Zoom places in my house. This is the second best only because the best has this glaring sunlight because it's uh, new right now. So I can't use uh -huh. that one. Um, but I'm just here at home. I'm working. I feel like, you know, we were just talking about our schedules earlier this yeah. year. You and I were both go, go, go in January for a book tour. I think we did, I did 19 cities in January and yeah. I went to London. And then as soon as the pandemic hit, it, hit, it was just very much grounded again. And so I feel that, you know, with the circumstance, the fact that I got had to you know, got to connect with readers at all was such yes. a privilege because so many authors are doing their entire tour virtually. And so I've had a little bit of both, but you mm. know, the fact that I can stay at home and try and stay safe, I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm right there with you. I remember um, coming back from my, so I did the US and I did the UK, came home within a week, we're in lockdown. And I remember being so grateful that I had had the chance to meet readers in person beforehand and my heart really went out to the authors who I know you know their books were coming out right yeah. at the beginning of COVID and you know the world hadn't yet adapted to being online now we're now we're pretty adapted um but, but even for a super connected world you know especially the publishing yeah. world didn't quite know how to move um but we got it but the you know the podcast has been running all this time and having these conversations and so i'm i'm really excited to to keep the conversation going with you here yes yes absolutely yeah. thank you yeah so our very first question that i ask each guest um who are some of the ancestors living or transitioned familial or societal who have influenced you on your journey Oh man, I thought about this a lot. <laughs> too much to say, but it's all a little bit jumbled. So bear with me. Um, I think that when I think to who I want to look to, who's come before me, 
and who inspires me on a number of levels. Uh, the people who really stand out tend to do three things. And mm. that's one, they, they have, you know, a version of the leftist politics that I seek to have of keeping humans and working class people first. Mm. Uh, second, they're amazing writers and just blow me away with their prose. And third, they have a presence that you cannot look away from, that it's almost mm. just a chemical uh, thing happening that they were meant to be speaking on these things. And the three people that I really thought to about this was uh, Fred Hampton, James Baldwin, and Martin Luther King. Um, mm. James Baldwin in particular, you know, when I'm writing, sometimes I need a little bit of a break and I always go on YouTube and look up speeches from people. And he's one that I, that I always come back to. His presence is out of control. He's just right. so controlled, but blasé yet genius, yet not polemic. There's so many things he's achieving. Um, his writing is amazing. And something I think that his writing does is his writing is not, you know, uh, you know, a preachy. It's no. just telling the truth. And yet he is very outspoken in his politics. And I really like that categoriz categorization. And I try to have it in my own life. So I would say that those are three people that I really look to in terms oh, of- Oh, I love that. Who's done it better? And how can yeah. I try? Well, I love that, especially how you've described James Baldwin, because he you're right, he does have this, he's very um he's, he's simultaneously very passionate and clear and um has a strong belief in what he's saying and almost has a detachment to it as well. Um and you know, it really makes you wonder like what in the back of like inside, what is he processing? How is he processing feeling so strongly about these issues? And at the same time, um, it, it's almost like he doesn't hold an expectation that things will change, but still is pushing for change. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There's a balance for both. And I feel that, you know, I'm the, I think I'm the person who, even after I come out of my favorite movie, I'm like, you know, it was a little bit weird. They could have done this a little bit better. And I'm always like kind of poking at the things I think could be better too. But when I see things that are broken and could be better, that actually inspires me to do things. I don't think it's coming from a negative place. It's just like, this is the place where we're more attention can go. So I think that he really totes that line of, you know, not going away from the truth, not look like saying things are better than they are and also presenting it in a way that makes you think and makes you really curious. And that's definitely what I try to do in my fiction. Mm, yeah. And it's, it's so interesting because usually when I ask guests about the ancestors who have influenced them, I can see a link between what they're saying about that, that ancestor and the person that I know, right. The person that I'm seeing in the work they're doing in the world. And what's really interesting is that, um, on the surface, you are very different to the people that you've just right, that you've just highlighted. But the thing that sticks out for me, specifically when you when you talk about James Baldwin, is your writing. It, like I, I remember reading it and sort of being like, "Oh my God, she's saying it!" You know, it's like cringy and awkward, and it makes you feel uncomfortable. But you want to keep looking at it. Um, T talk to us about first of all for people who have never heard yeah. of such a fun age who I don't know we're on a different planet this year I guess and <laughs> didn't see it everywhere um set us up with the with the uh, the setup of the book and then we'll talk about what we're talking about the cringiness the awkwardness yes those are all my favorite things so yes so uh, my book such a fun age starts on a Saturday night in September in 2015 we meet Amira Tucker. She's a 25 year old recent Temple University graduate. She is a babysitter. She's an African American woman. She also works part time as a typist. She's at this place in her life where she doesn't know what she wants to do. She's, you know, making the same crock pot meal four nights a week. She's always a bit broke and she doesn't have this driving passion that she's looking to. So she's trying to figure it out. And one night she's hanging out with her girlfriends, they're partying, they're having a good time when the woman she babysits for, Alex Chamberlain, calls her and says, Amira, we've had an emergency. Can you please take our three-year-old to the grocery store, please? I'll pay you double. She's like, pay you double? Yes, I'm coming <laughs> right now. She goes and takes young Briar to the grocery store. They're laughing. They're dancing to Whitney Houston until a customer and a security guard, upon seeing a Black woman with a white child, accuse her of kidnapping. 
Mm. And it becomes a very familiar situation where someone pulls out their cell phone. She's very upset. Um, tensions are raised and yet it's not one of the more violent situations that we see on TV often. And I would say from there, it turns into a comedy of good intentions mm. and really questions ownership and what it means to be family and what it means to do the right thing for the wrong yeah. reason. Yeah. Yeah. So while I was getting ready uh, for our conversation, I was just chatting with my husband and just telling him about you and about this book and giving him the setup. And he was like, wait, did this happen in real life? Just as I was, (laughs) because it sounds like something that would happen in real life. And I said, no, it's, it's a fictional story, but it sounds like it would. But I said, actually, what's notable about the story isn't so much that incident it's the slow burn that happens throughout the whole rest of the story um, where there are so many different dynamics. And I want to make sure that this is a spoiler free zone. So I don't want to give people, you know, I want them to read the book. So go get the book. Everything um, I just did only in the first chapter. was There's only no- in the first chapter. That isn't even the sort most of- interesting <laughs> part of this book. Um, but there are some key dynamics that show up in this book that are, like I said, those cringy, awkward parts of the way that um, race, class, um, friendship, right? Relationships, all of these dynamics show up and it's so real <laughs> and it's and it's so uncomfortable. Um, what makes you write that way? Like, what do you enjoy? Because you seem to really enjoy it. <laughs> I do, like, too much, like too much I enjoy it. You know? I think from the time when I was little, I love be, being a bit uneasy when I'm mm-hmm. reading something from a very basic standpoint of I loved those goosebumps books by R.O. Stein. I think I, I hated of- them. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I will take all of the goosebumps. They were my favorite. Uh, I even loved, you know, the shows like Are You Afraid of the Dark? There was something right. about books that made me have a little bit of, of a sense of unease, but it wasn't, you know, pure gore and horror. That no. wasn't really my jam. Um, there's something about, you know, when a story sets up a world and the etiquette of that world and the culture, and then a little tiny glitch happens and everything seems a little off. Um, that's where I'm really interested and especially how culture and language work together and showing those glitches and, and how manners often take the space of, you know, actual propriety for human life in some right. cases. Right. And so, I love dialogue that sounds exactly like it happens in the real world. There's something really magical when you're like, oh my gosh, I know this person. I've seen this person. I can hear them say that. Um, And so I like trying to get that dialogue really perfect. And I also just really love a page turner um, that makes me have that what's going to happen feeling at the end. But I also do think that incidents like Amira's where, you know, no one got hurt. I don't think that the trauma is gone. I think that she has to think about what she's doing for the rest of her life when she walks into a grocery store or a number of other white spaces. And I think that, absolutely. And I think that something happens the same way that capital, you know, makes you, tries to make you think is that what did you do wrong in this situation? Mm. What can you do better? There's a moment where Amira tries to let him know that she can talk in a certain way to try and protect herself. And so I think what happens with these events um, and the way that work and culture happens is you say, okay, well, next time I go in, I'm not going to wear this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. When you're not the problem, <laughs> you right. got called right. to it. the problem is that people see other people in this way. And so it's been a really interesting ride because, you know, some people will read this book and say, it was so cringy. I loved it. And some will say it was cringy. I hate, it. I couldn't. <laughs> right. It was too real. Yes. And I respect both sides. I completely yeah. understand it. Um, but the the things that I am gravitated towards are things that are so real that they're almost a little bit haunting. Yes. So, you know, I, um, before we hit record on this conversation, I was telling you that when I was on tour for my book earlier this year, every bookshop I went to, because I, I pre-signed my books. So they would bring oh. in, you know, the, the, my books and I would always see another another load and it's all Kylie's books, just Kylie, 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 Kylie. And I was very excited every time I saw um, I saw the book. But it, it, it's very interesting being a nonfiction writer who writes about 
white supremacy and yourself being a fiction writer who is in one part writing about white supremacy and obviously other topics and themes as well. Um, I was recently asked in an interview, you know, do you think that um, for people who have white privilege, who are wanting to learn about racism, that you know, nonfiction is more helpful or fiction is more helpful or, mm -hmm. or both. And I said, no, both and poetry, oh. add poetry to that as well, right? All aspects yeah. are important because there's something that fiction can reveal in the nuances and the complexities that nonfiction cannot, I believe. Um, and this so- This is what I wanted to ask you about as yes. well. You feed into other modes, because for me, especially in the beginning phases of, of writing something, nonfiction is imperative to me. Yeah. Um, of looking into what, you know, the experts have already provided this whole heap of work for me and how my characters feed off of that. I'm curious if fiction works the same way for you. Um, so I'm not a fiction writer. And so anytime I meet a fiction writer, I'm like, you're magic, you're a wizard. How do you make, how do you make characters? How do you make plot? Like, I don't, I don't, I, I want what you have to be able to do that. Um, but I remember reading it and being able to link very small, like those cringy moments, right? Very small minor behaviors or dialogue or exchanges that I could say, oh, that links to white saviorism in my book. That links to tokenism, right? That links to like all of these little things. And so it was very, um, and it's weird to say this about such a hard topic, but it was very satisfying making those links to each other for me um, because it you were able to put it together in a way that did speak to the subtleties. And I think so often people think about white supremacy and racism as that event that happens at the beginning of your book. Yeah only and not as the daily interactions, the daily microaggressions um, that happen between people who are not necessarily enemies, right? People who work for each other, with each other, are in relationship with one another. And it's always there in the background. And I feel the, almost, the always there is often harder to deal with than yeah. the event that happens. Uh, something that has happened on tour which I completely understand is, is people often ask me, have you had a big event like this in the beginning um, that you were, were feeding from? And I think every black person has had a moment where they were really afraid. At the same time, one, I don't love to talk about like two personal events, but two, I feel that me sharing something like that takes away from how mm. I feel actually human behavior operates. Because what happens is, you know, in these instances of very blatant, racism that is captured on a cell phone. I call it cartoon racism because mm -hmm. there's a person to root for. There's someone who's saying the N-word and who's so outrightly insane right. and bigoted. And that's very harmful in its own way. But it's often presenting a black woman who is ready. She's had enough. She's yes. ready. She has time that day and that is it. And listen, I wish I was there all the time, but I'm not. And like, mm -hmm. I am the person who's like, you know, two days after someone says something, I'm like, hey, can we talk about this thing that you said? Like, I need a little bit of time. And Amira is the same way. She's not going to say the perfect thing in these moments. And so I do wonder if sometimes these videos are setting Black women up to perform right. in a satisfying way that, you know, that's something that we shouldn't have to get good at, you know? Yeah. What I found really interesting about Amira was that one of the things I found interesting about her was that she really, you know, somebody was taping this um interaction that happened and she really didn't want it shared. She didn't want it out there. She didn't want it. She didn't want that. And um I think so often, and we've seen it this, we're recording this in 2020, we've seen it this year in a big way with the murder of George Floyd, and that if it's on camera and we've seen it, that there's proof, then then we can give our sympathies. Then, you know, people who have white privilege or who are not black can say, what a terrible thing that happened. Um, and and to what extent to, do we then start participating in our own traumatization of saying, I have to show, here's the proof, it happened to me. Right, and, how, and there, there are so much bigger instances where it is impossible mm. to show the proof. How do you show the proof of a doctor not listening to you? Or how do you show the proof of, you know, a housing application not being accepted? 
because of your last name when your other friend would. There are so many issues of huge white supremacy and, and, and racism that are so ingrained in the systems that they came from that it's impossible yeah. to show that proof. And so just saying, oh, look at this film, you know, I'm not sure if that always sets us up properly to see racism for what it is. That being said, I would pull out my phone if I felt scared too. Sometimes that's the only yes. just that you have, but right. I also wonder about what that's doing to to other issues. Yes. And you you speak about, and I've heard you talk about this in interviews, that while um that incident at the beginning of the book, and even some of the uh personal interactions, maybe things that we can point to that we can say, oh, that's a behavior, or that's something that was done that was wrong. What's lying under the surface is actually the underlying systems of um, classism and racism, institutional racism that Amira um, is having to face on both fronts, right? Um, can you speak to uh, why it was important to not only speak about race, but also class as well? Oh, yes. I mean, I could go off on this. Yes, this is all my favorite stuff. Uh, I just feel that there's, it's a moot point to talk about race aside from class, because I think that they feed into each other. I think they come from one another. And I think that at the end of the day, money is power. And mm. so if, you know, I think that now we are in an area where it's very, very easy to point at systems that have helped the black bourgeoisie and elite, you know, also operate in white supremacy as well. Yeah. And so in that, I can just, for example, in that first scene, so much of Amira's, you know, incident is because she's a very dark skinned woman, but also there's her hair, there's her mm. clothing, there's the way that she speaks. Um, there's her friend that she's with. All of those things are little class indicators that dictate how people treat her and what they feel she's deserving of as well. Yeah. And so, you know, Alex, I would say that Alex, the woman that she works for, doesn't have a problem communicating with Black people who are in the same class solidarity. I think that she has a problem dealing with a low, low income Black woman who is depending on her for a number of reasons. One, she doesn't have that many people low income in her circle. But two, she's faced with the fact that not only does she rely on Amira, but Amira relies on her. And she mm -hmm. doesn't like that pressure. And so she's like, uh, let's be friends. You're not my employee. <laughs> let's be friends right. in a very awkward way. Um, and I think that, you know, what happens is when you are denying your employer role, then yeah. you don't give the benefits that an employee should, should like, you know, I had a lot of service jobs and the best ones were the ones where my boss was saying it's five o'clock, go home. You know, you need this, right. make sure you're taking your time off. Um, but when someone like Alex is saying, oh, do you want to have a glass of wine with me? Do you want to hang out? Right? <laughs> <laughs> you end up with this young woman who thinks, Ugh, I don't want her to think that I'm like not a friendly person and that I right. don't want this job. And, and that's where more emotional labor comes in. The relationship between Amira, the young African-American, 25-year-old woman, and Alex, her white uh, middle class uh, employer, um, is the, like one of the most interesting things that I've ever read. Um, simply because I think, uh, I know, I know that <laughs> I, you know, not necessarily because I've been a nanny working for a white woman, but because of the ways in which Alex was doing mental gymnastics to, try and figure out how to get this young black woman to like her and be her friend. Yes. I, I, it was, that was one of the joys of book tour in January. <laughs> so many black women coming up to me and saying, I'm going to give this to my coworker, Amanda, cause she needs it. <laughs> uh, because I mean, I feel that this is a familiar person to a lot of black women, especially domestic workers in white spaces um that person whose compliments hurt a little bit that person who you can tell that they feel if i can get this person to like me that means i'm doing a good job i need that right. person to call me for my validation and yeah alex she makes a lot of mistakes and that's oh it's the worst um <laughs> one of the you know every time you read a book there's always a moment that you you read a certain passage and then you have to put the book down <laughs> <laughs> and then, then reread it a million times over, right? And the, the passage in, in, in the book, and I can't remember the exact word that was used, but there was a, a passage where 
um, Alex and Amira are having a conversation and Amira uses a word that Alex didn't expect her to use. I can't remember what the word was. Can you remind me? Connoisseur. Yeah. Connoisseur, right. Connoisseur. And Alex inside of herself registers that, oh, I didn't know that she knows that word and then checks herself. Why would I expect her not to know that word? And it made me read it and read it again. I think I shared it on my Instagram stories because it was just, it, I was, love that. It, was, it was so good because when I did the me and white supremacy Instagram challenge and we did the day on black women, there were so many revelations from white people, white women, especially mm-hmm. on presumptions they have made about black women and about how educated we are or how um, uh, able to express ourselves articulately in quotes. Um, and, and so I read it and I was like, this is, this is real. Like, I know it's real because I did the challenge and I saw it, but here it is in a fiction story. So many of us are experiencing these daily interactions of people undervaluing or under expecting from us and yeah. yet we're also expected to work twice as hard just to yes. <laughs> that, is, that, is that is it precisely and it's kind of astounding that it works so easily with the under expectations and then the over expectations it's right out of control and i can't tell you how many podcasts i've done in presenting this book where we get done and a white woman says, you are so articulate. Thank you so much. And I think about it and I'm like, I'm a writer. It's, it's my job. It's literally my job. <laughs> you know, and I would, you know, if you were inter- inter- interviewing a scientist, you would say, you are not so scientific. That's amazing. Like, it's right. just so, so strange. And yeah, Amira and Alex, Alex is really dealing with all of these emotions in real time. And she is you know, like a math game, like saying like, okay, well, how does a person who listens to this music also know right. this word? And, and it doesn't make any sense to her. But I think for a lot of, you know, black women, it's, it's so simple. This is my work life, which is in a white space. And this is my home life where I get to do whatever I want. And I've really seen how that home life is, is seen, especially releasing a book, because I have to tell you, I had not the ones that I chose, but I had agents and editors saying to me, hey, can you make this book a little bit blacker? Or, hey, can you pull back on the blackness? Wow. A little bit? And for so many people, I think it was impossible for them to hear Black women speaking in the way that they do at home having fun and also see this book as literary when wow. those things are not working against each other. Yeah. And so it was a really big lesson in, again, just telling the truth and hoping that the people who are also looking for that truth will understand it. And I, I'm happy to say that my agent and editor really understood what I was trying to do. I'm and so glad. To urban anything up. Yeah, all. I'm yeah. so glad. Um, you know, code switching is is a real skill that it we, is. yes, that we, that we have to develop. And I'm thinking about what you were saying about um, it, I think in another interview you were talking about, this is also like one of the oldest stories of time, which is black women being domestic care workers for white women's children. And it was the same then, right? Of at, when you're caring for the child and you're in, the, you're in your employer's place, um, whether they were paying you or not, you had to be one type of person and then when you go home with your own family you're a different type of person what do you think that does oh man because we can we can we can talk about how it's a skill right and it's a really it's a cool skill to have but it also is doing something to us 100 that's a great question it's 100 doing something and i'll tell you there's a little interaction that i had that just reminds me of i think you know i used to be a nanny for a long time Mm. And I was with a little girl for four years. I was very close to her family. But in the beginning, I think she was maybe three years old. And we spent a lot of time just one-on-one, just the two of us. And we would play this little like pillow fighting game. This is so silly, but she loved it. We were playing <laughs> pillow fighting game where, you know, I would say to her, come on, girl, what's up? What you got? What you got? And she would hit me with the pillow and I would fall over and she thought it was hilarious. Okay. So that was just our little game that we would play in private. Mm-hmm. I take this girl to a play date. 
and I hear her playing a pillow fight game with her friends. She's white. And she says to her friends, come on, girl, what you got? What you got? And I heard it. <laughs> but I panicked. I thought her parents are going to hear her talking like that. And they're going to say, what is that? Where did you learn that? And they're going to get mad at me. Mm. And when I think about that, that is heartbreaking because that is mm. me at my best playing with your child. She's safe. We're having a good time. I'm making her laugh. But I think it's also a familiar feeling of a lot of black women of who oh, I got too comfortable mm. I a little bit. I need to make sure that my language is something that these parents are going to be okay with hearing their child say to their friends. And so I don't think that that's a good, healthy reaction. No. I don't know. I can't say, you know, on a, you know, sociological, you know, place what that's doing to me, but I think that division is, is, is harmful, especially when it comes to domestic work. Part of your job is loving someone and you can love someone better when you're, when you're really comfortable. And yeah. I, I remember that moment of feeling like, okay, you got too comfortable. You have to be cool. You can't <laughs> talk right. to her like that. Right. Um, and, really sad. and it's, you know, we're not, talking about, you know, um, how we have to show up at work in a, you know, professionally, this is not about that. This is about actually masking who you are, right? This is about being afraid that who you are, um, is dangerous to other people and will be judged in, in an inferior way. I often think about the amount of energy it takes, you know, that we expend, to categorize ourselves in this way for our own safety and just not having to deal with white supremacy, right? Not having to deal with all the stuff, but where yeah. does that energy go and what can we do with it um, is, is just something yeah. that I think about a lot. And, and I think about Amira as, you know, she is in her early twenties. So mm -hmm. she's in that part of her life. I was a I was such a mess. Book readings be like, can you give me advice? I'm like, no, I, <laughs> I, can't I get it now, but yeah, she's right. in a hard place for sure. She's in a hard place. And what was interesting for me with her was that, you know, I'm somebody who took me a while to figure out what I was doing, but I always knew that there was something, right? Yeah. I always knew that there was something that I was supposed to be doing. I was supposed to be helping people in some way. Um, it just took me a while to figure out what that was. Mm -hmm. With Amira, what's really interesting is that she's she's still figure she's still figuring it out, right? She's there's nothing that's really tugging or pulling at her um, in that way. And I think I noticed as I was reading, I noticed my own frustration with it. Like, what is it, girl? Like, what is it that you want to be doing? You know? Yes, I think that we are conditioned to want her to be better in systems that weren't made for her. Oh, it's yes. So easy to say, Amira, like, you should be able to just have this job for the rest of your life, but I'm letting you know about the systems that we live in and you're going to want help. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. so easy to get wrapped up in that and say, Amira, like, I need you to do this. And it's so easy to point at her instead of like, this is weird. Why doesn't she just have healthcare? Like she's right. like a human being right. and she should just be able to go to the doctor, you know, whenever she wants. And I totally, you know, I also like you, like I knew I wanted to write. And so it was easier for me at the end of a hard day where I was like, okay, I can pay my rent. I can keep writing. It's fine. You know, but I do think that there are many 25 year olds like this who were like, I don't really know what I'm trying to do. And I feel like there were so many jobs that I didn't even know existed until yes. I was 28, 29. Yeah. And yeah. now that I'm 33, it seems a little crazy to me that like, you know, he, you turn 18 in the States and they're like, pick a major, just, right. do, that. <laughs> just do that for the rest of your life. Right. It's crazy. Yes. And I feel like I was such a different person then. And, and my skills were different. And Amira is just, you know, kind of a paramour of what that looks like when someone doesn't have this extreme passion, which is very normal. Yeah. Right. And, and it's, I'm thinking about how there's this expectation as well, right, for us that we need to get it together earlier. There isn't the space to be figuring it out for longer. There isn't both because um, 
like you said, the systems are not made for us to thrive. Um, and because there is so much that is put upon black women to be everything to everyone. So if you don't have it figured out, you know, where do you fit? And I definitely, as I was reading it and tracked that within myself and being like, well, why can't she just be figuring yeah. it out? You know, why, why do you, why do you, why do you need that to happen? Um, so that was really interesting for me. And there was a, there was a black woman character in the book that also mirrors that back to her as well. That was really interesting reading her, reading that interaction between the two of them. I feel like black women in particular have a strong reaction to Tamara. And usually they're like, this is my mom's friend, Denise. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, she exists. And it's so funny, you know, it, you know, this year, I'm sure that you feel the same way, the way that you can't control how people relate to your art and you can't control what brings people to your art. And sometimes what brings people to your art is the, death of a man who shouldn't have died, who was murdered on camera. And people say, what do I do? Let me grab some black art. And and that's what brings them there. And so through that, I think that what happens often is sometimes white people say, okay, I'm going to use this fiction book as a pedagogical tool. So whatever this black woman, Tamara is telling me to do, that's right. That's what I'm, that's it. Right. No (laughs) (laughs) way. You know, Black people come in all sorts of, you know, uh, respectability politics and yeah. classes and opinions and and harmful thoughts. And, and Tamara is, I think, for many Black women, a familiar character of someone who's a bit pushy, who feels like they're helping you, um, someone who's very polished in a very particular academic way. Um, I could see her as I was reading it. I was like, oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know this person. <laughs> I think everyone's like sat next to someone like that at a wedding where you're like, yes. okay, <laughs> like you're yes. very kind and you're very smart, but I don't know about this. And so I think from a writing perspective, I was very excited to put someone like Amira in a room with Tamara. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. And then the other major dynamic that I want our future readers of this book to, to look at is the dynamic between Amira and Kelly. It's a big one. Yes. Right. So who is Kelly? Kelly is a young man who films Amira being interrogated by the police at the grocery store. And he's white, he's very tall, he went to Penn State, and he's very adamant that Amira should seek justice and should, you know, turn this, you know, video into a news station or write an op-ed about it. And she's she's not really into that. And so Amira and, and Kelly see each other a week or two after the event and they start fooling around <laughs> and then they eventually start dating. And Kelly, you know, my goal for him was that I wanted the reader to kind of date him with Amira and figure out what he's about, (laughs) you know, from dating someone who's white, who hangs out with a lot of black people. And you're trying to figure out what that means. And sometimes Kelly really nails it. Sometimes he's really funny. He really likes her. Um, They're attracted to each other. And that part is great. And sometimes he, he messes up. And I wanted it to just feel so real of those moments when white people mess up and you don't know what to do. And it's, mm. you know, that moment where you're like, okay, well, I'm at work. I want a promotion. I'm going to pretend like I didn't hear that. Or, you right. know what? We're at a restaurant. I want to finish my entree. I don't want to do that right now. Right. Um, and so here definitely has a few moments of like that with Kelly for sure. And with Kelly and Alex, there is this dynamic, you know, that's, of them wanting to guide Amira in a certain way or have ownership over her in a certain way or feel uh, more connected to her than the other does. Um, And it's like Amira becomes the site of a battle between a white woman and a a white man. She does for sure. Yes, I think that they both, I think what can happen in, in fiction and in real life is that, you know, tokenism and ownership can come really harmoniously with affection for someone. Mm. I really think that Kelly and Alex really do care about Amira. I think that they think she's very special and and funny. Um, But, you know, I wish that racism worked in this way where you could just easily (laughs) see someone and be like, that person's racist, I'm going to stay away from them. (laughs) That's it. Uh, but it comes with a lot of love and support and in other ways too, which I think makes it even more scary. 
And so it has to figure out like, okay, what are you getting out of this relationship? And, you know, when you tell the story of how we met, how performatively are you telling it? What are you getting out of this? What does it say about you? There's a lot of questions she has to work through. And she's also 25. She's like, I'm not going to get married like right now. Like, let's just. (laughs) Right. Just figuring it out. Right. Um, You, you, like what I really appreciate is that you're speaking about these really tough topics these microaggression behaviors. And at the same time, we get to see, especially with Amira and Alex, who are the two, kind of we get to hear it from both of their sides, like their humanity as well. They're- Why was that important? I mean, I know writing characters, they have to be realistic, but we could have had we could have had Alex as the as the villain. Right. But you right. didn't. Yeah. You know- when I teach undergrads, we do an exercise where my students have to show two different characters who are exact opposites from each other doing the same activity, mm. like baking or golfing, and they have to show them being completely opposite doing it. And no one's allowed to be good or bad. Because the fact is, as humans, we're all good at things. We all have strengths and weaknesses. And I feel that when you're writing fiction, your character who does the most damage, you have to give them a win at some point. You have to show what great handwriting they have, or if they offer to give someone a ride to the airport, or if they have an embarrassing moment, you have to humanize them because then those worst moments hit even harder. Mm -hmm. Um, I also just think that, you know, I've known a lot of Alex's too, and they can be really delightful. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, especially when you're working and trying to advance in your career, there's a lot of people who like, even if their attempts at helping are not exactly, you know, only for you, they can end up helping you. That's just the reality of how it works. And so it was really important for me to not just, you know, poop on Alex the whole time. Also, because when you're writing a book, you're writing it for like three years. So you have to like the people a little time. Right, right. So this is a great way. This is a great part for us to segue into your journey as a writer. Now, sure. this is your debut published novel, but not your first book. Yeah. And I feel like this is really important to say because when you hear, oh, this is their debut book, right? This is their debut novel. It makes it seem like, oh, Kylie just woke up one day and was like, I'm going to pen a best selling book. Right? <laughs> Thank you for saying that because I, I know it's it's my first published book. It's maybe my eighth or ninth novel. This is just the one yeah. that made it. And I, it sounds trite, but I truly believe that those bad novels that will never see the light of day <laughs> are informing my writing now and helping me understand my obsessions and my tendencies and my bad mm-hmm. habit and how to get rid of those. Um, and so, yes, this is the first, this is the first good novel is what I like to say. <laughs> yeah. In those um, first eight, eight or nine novels, what were you working through and what were you discovering about yourself and the way that you like to write? That's a great question. Um, I think part of what comes with learning about what you like to write is also what you love to read. So I think Mm. that as I was learning about what I like as a writer and, and trying to, you know, imitate the writers that I love, it's one, a ton of dialogue that is so realistic that you can hear it. There's a rhythm and a science to the words that you're putting on the page I didn't understand that I was interested in writing about class until much later when I was in graduate school and had the time to read nonfiction and the experts who were doing a lot of the work for me. Um, I realized that structure was really important to me. And I, even though those class issues are so important, but that thriller element is really, really important to my read as well. You know, that like, okay, I'm just gonna do one more chapter feeling is really important to me. Yeah. And so something I work with my editor on a lot that I've gotten better at is structure and where you deploy information and how you keep the reader going and satisfy them and pull them, all of those, those little things for sure. Mm, that learning the, the craft of writing itself, but also I guess how you translate that craft. Oh yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. There, I didn't understand what style was until much later. And I do kind of think that style finds you a bit. And I think yeah. that you structure to assist your style is, is really important. I have to ask the same of you and how you learned your style. Oh gosh. I think it's the same thing. I I remember a couple of years ago um, when I was like, Oh, I think, I think I'm going to be a writer. I think I can do this. I really want to do this. Um, But looking to everyone else, right. How do they write? How do they do it? How do they do it? And 
thinking that if I could just take the best parts of the way that I see my favorite writers show up and mash it all together, <laughs> that I'll make something that is me, right? And it just, it just doesn't work that way. Um, I think so much of it is the internal work of self-discovery, self-acceptance, self-love. I think it, 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 there's an energy that shines through on the page that comes from a deep connectedness with yourself. Like obviously, you know, your editorial team and everyone helps to shape it and make it this masterpiece, right. but they have to work with the material that's there. And the material that's there is not just the words, yeah. it's also the, the, like the blocks that you built one on top of the other to build this foundation of who you are. Um, yes. And thankfully we kept, we keep getting better because we keep building that foundation. We keep growing. I, I didn't, that was something that I never thought about while writing a book, how magical it is to find people who want and understand the spirit of what you're writing and to how to, how to meet you where you're at and make that the best that can be wherever yes. it is. Yes. It's yeah. very different but then it's it's really magical at the end yeah I'd love to speak about especially for our listeners who may be writers or aspiring writers especially who may be people of color about um your journey as an author as a black woman um a person of color how do how do you advocate for yourself to make sure that you know your boundary your your vision, your voice is respected, and that you have the best team for you. Because yeah. building that team is so, so important. It's so, I, I never knew how important it was. And now I'm like, how did I think I could do this by myself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so I think I had the same thing as you, where in my 20s, I decided that I want to be able to do this. And even if I, I can't work. I at least want to teach because I just want to be involved in the literary world in some way. And so I started writing short stories more seriously and submitting them to contests and literary mm -hmm. journals when I was around 23 to like 26, 27. And I think during that time, I tried to count the other day. I think it was something like 150 rejections. Wow. Just constantly coming <laughs> in. And <laughs> And, you know, I did get some acceptances and then sometimes there were what I call good no's, which is, mm. you know, dear author, um, so sorry, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but this one almost made it. And I'd be like, oh, yes, this is the day. And I would just kind of live off of those comments for, for a very long time. And so I decided <laughs> to go to graduate school. I had one of those moments where I was like, I want to write and I don't even know what I don't know. I mm. need someone to help me. And so I applied to graduate school and I was working as a receptionist at the time and I got rejected from every single school and it was heartbreaking. Oh. It was really hard. I was like, do I just, what do I do? And so at the time, my then boyfriend, now husband had a job opportunity in Arkansas and he said, do you want to go have a reset? It's really cheap to live there. You can try again. And I said, hmm. let's do it. Let's go to Arkansas. Arkansas is beautiful. I don't know if you've been, it's really, really pretty. It's quiet. It's cheap. I got a job as a barista at a coffee kind of bodega shop. I got another job at a very scammy website that I should not have been working for, but I was very broke. <laughs> and I just kept writing and I applied to graduate school again. And the second time I got into nine schools, it oh, just wow. having that space just to think, you know, yeah. made all of the difference in my writing. And so I had about a hundred pages of such a fun age then, and I took them to graduate school and I was kind of crazy about finding my readers. I just wanted to find people who would be my readers for the rest of my life. And I'm so happy to say that I have three women who are just wonderful and mm -hmm. they do not tell me everything I write is great. Sometimes they're like, this ain't it, you know, or right now I'm writing something where I have a character who's kind of like me, but her humor is not like me. And my friends constantly like, ah, this is you. This is not her. Like you need to pull back. And so mm. this was really, really important. And then connecting with two professors who really helped me with my writing. I think graduate school is wonderful if you can do it. I don't think anyone should go into debt doing it. That is my hot take. I think someone should pay you to do it. Um, but graduate school is really wonderful. And from there, it's just having friends who keep you accountable, I feel, and keeping yourself accountable. Um, I feel that vague uh, goals don't really work for me. I feel like mm. saying, I'm going to write more this year 
is a little too vague. I think it has to be, I'm going to get 500 words on the page every day, no matter, just numbers. Mm -hmm. Numbers are really, really important. Um, and from there, I mean, just trusting the experts. Feedback is so important. You really can't write by yourself. You need to make sure what's happening in your head is what's happening on the page. And I think that's often the hardest part, right? Because you have this vision of what you think it should be and how you, you know, and, and people are saying, no, maybe it should be this way, or I don't like that. Um, how do you build up the resiliency to hear that and to keep moving forward? <laughs> oh, I mean, I mean, it's such a tricky balance between one, trusting your gut and writing what you're obsessed with, and two, finding people who are going to serve the story always. And believe it, the best thing is like when someone says like, oh, why don't you just have her come in the left door? And you're like, oh, I'm an idiot. Of course, I should do that thing <laughs> that they're telling me. But sometimes they're like, I don't think you need this part. And I'm like, mm, no, I'm hilarious. Like I'm keeping it. Like, <laughs> a little bit of a balance. And, but then if someone else tells me, I'm like, okay, I have to cut this. It's such a balance of, of give and take. Um, and I think that I've gotten better at it. I think that I know who to go to for what I have a friend who's really good at structure. I have a friend who's really good at grammar. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who's really good at finding patterns in my mm -hmm. work. So it's using all of their strengths to my writing. But honestly, I think it's what you were saying before. The more you're writing, the more you know the spirit of the thing. Yes. Um, just trusting yourself over yeah. and over again, which is not easy. Yeah. No, it's not. But I, I love that we're having this conversation around, you know, that it's not just Kylie you know, who, yes, you are the driving force behind it. You're the one who laid the words down. You're the one who visioned the characters and molded them. But mm -hmm. without the people around you who are your support network, whether it be personally or professionally, such a fun age wouldn't exist in the way that it does. And oh. so often when we think about good ancestors, especially those from the past who we see as these icons, these trailblazers, we see them as the, this one individual, like this iconoclast or this pioneer, um, yeah. this, this leader who just stood apart from everyone else. And we discount or we don't highlight, celebrate, appreciate everyone else who is making sure that they are able to do what they are doing. Um, those behind the scenes people are so <laughs> crucial to all of it. Yeah. Yes. 100%. Like, and I also feel like I'm someone who, when I'm not writing, I don't, I like working behind the scenes too. And those jobs are, are very, very fruitful when you feel like you're part of a community. Mm. And so all of those roles are so important. And yeah, there's so many, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if you feel this way too. There's so many lines that I can point to in my book where I'm like, oh, that wouldn't have existed if I hadn't heard this thing or if that wouldn't uh, yes. exist. It's just yes. so touching. I remember one time my husband came in the room and said, did you know that George Washington's teeth were made from slaves' teeth? And I said, well, I had no idea. Right. And that inspired a short story that ended up getting me into Iowa. Like wow. just that journey of yes. like, we need each other. I mean, it sounds so cheesy, but community makes art. It's so, so important. Yes, I love that. Um, so where you're at right now, you have like we said, it's your debut book, not your first book, but your debut published book. But this year you were really thrust into the limelight in this huge way. And I presume have been on this massive roller coaster. Um, are you comfortable on the roller coaster? Do you feel that you're driving the roller coaster? Somebody else is? Do you want to get off the roller coaster? <laughs> What a, what a fantastic question. Uh, it depends on the day. Uh -huh. I will say that, um, you know, my publishing team, I want to work with them again and again. They're so lovely and just hear me and understand me, you know, from the very beginning, you know, when we were talking about black people doing, you know, twice the work, which right. I think happens in publishing. When I came into my first meeting with my publishing house, I was like, listen, I want to make sure this book gets into the hands of black people. I want to make sure that I launch at a black owned place. And even though that's extra work that I did, they were like, done, done, done. What else can we do? Let's go, let's go. Um, and so that has been wonderful. And I feel like they're on the roller coaster with me for sure. Right. On another level, you know, Writers are used to being by themselves. Right. So, <laughs> what are what am I doing here? And so I'm the kind of person who I like categories and I do like setting up boundaries. And so mm -hmm. 
I don't feel like they're restricting. I feel like they're almost like liberating a little bit. Definitely. Yes. I I said, okay, what do I, what are my boundaries for me? You know, I don't tell, you know, super personal things about my family because they aren't, they didn't write the book, (laughs) you know, like they didn't ask for any of this. Um, I don't particularly like sharing things about my home or my space, um, Mm. which I think like, you know, I will definitely click on like, oh, this writer's desk or whatever, but I'm just not really into showing that for, for me. I kind of like to pretend like I have a mascot hat on and I don't like to take it off and have anyone like see me smoking a cigarette backstage. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think having those, but I mean, I'm huge on boundaries, so I'm right there with you. But I think being thrust into the limelight by something that, you know, you want to, you want it to happen. You, you've poured so much of yourself, your energy, sure. your creativity into this book. You want it to do what it's doing in the world. And there's always this tug of like, but I also just want to be in my hermit cave writing and <laughs> being alone. So good. I also think something that's interesting for fiction writers too is you write a book and then readers come to you and say, okay, so you talk about themes of domestic work, which means you're an expert on Mm. domestic work. Now we're going to ask you, and it's like, no, this book shows that I'm interested in it. This is, you know, a thesis project, but that doesn't mean that I am an expert. Like let's connect with other people who actually are experts on this. And so I am happy that that's led me to work with the Domestic Workers National Alliance, which has been a highlight of this year and people who actually know what they're talking about. And I'm happy to be a spokesman when I can. That's awesome. Do you find that particularly with the book coming out this year and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement this year, that people have only been wanting to talk about the race aspect of things or or trying to sort of pigeonhole you just into being a black writer who writes about race or do you find that people are giving you the freedom to be all all of the things yes I mean I feel that I feel that black women are very good at you know going into an interview the second they're like tell me about your black trauma like the worst right talk about my book yes it's just very very obvious I feel and so yes I do feel that for many it's like a self they're they're using black artists as a self-soothing mechanism Mm. um, trying to uh you know I'm putting quotes around do the work and asking black people about their experience um and I just as a fiction writer I come from the place of you know other people are much more interesting to me language is much more interesting to me and so are you know elements of class within that which I think race is included in all those things as well. And so I think I've gotten good at using those boundaries and turning, turning the conversation back whenever I need to. I love that. Do you find that people are sometimes maybe frustrated that there's no clear conclusion that, that the whole thing wasn't resolved, right? That the messy characters, we didn't have a hero and the villain at the end. Um, Because that's oftentimes when people think about racism, that's the terms that they're thinking of it in is the bad people, the good people. And justice is about the good people winning and the bad people being punished when we're so much more complex than that. That is, that's an excellent point. And you know what actually that reminds me of is, is so many of my students, when we would talk about storytelling, they would say a good story tells you a lesson at the end. And I was, mm. No, mm. no. <laughs> <laughs> right away. And, and yes, that does happen all the time. I was in Savannah, Georgia and a white woman asked me, in a Q and A, like, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? And I, and I said, you know, I, I want you to enjoy my fiction. The, the, the things <laughs> that, that that's not the answer I was after. <laughs> then, Tell me how know, to be a good ally. <laughs> two hours later, I'm sitting in the hotel, ready to go out, and she comes up to me, and there are tears in her eyes, and she oh, said, wow. "I just want to give you a platform. I just want you to tell me what to do. Tell me what to do." And I just can't help but think of you were putting labor on me. Yes. That is not my job. It is not my job at all. You know, that I'm an artist. Um, And maybe, you know, it's something that you should look into that you are so desperate for an answer in in this world. Um, And I think, you know, her reading of it is just as legitimate as everyone else's. And I love that it left her with that. Um, but I have to, I think I have to be strong and say, that's not my job. That's absolutely not your job. I think the, the amazing thing that this book does is, is so it takes, it takes such a, um, 
not simple story, but it really is. It's in the nuances. It's not these like big, massive plot twists and action story and all of this. It's these everyday interactions, but exposes them uh, in ways that you can't turn away from, even though you want to. Um, and then people are left with, okay, so where to from here? I mean, as a, as a black woman reading this, I remember reading it and like I said, cringing, but also thinking, wow, um, these interactions from well-meaning white people, the people who really want to do the right thing are so exhausting, <laughs> so, so exhausting that it leaves you feeling like, where do I go from here? What am I supposed to do? How do I interact with the well-meaning white people in my life, let alone the people who are um, proudly racist, right? The people who don't even know that they are and want to do the right thing. But that's for me to figure out. That's not for Kylie to answer for me. Yes. Yes. It's like, you know, when I'm teaching, I'm like, I'm your teacher. I'm not your friend. <laughs> that is my role here. And I feel now as, you know, a storyteller, I'm a writer. I'm not your mom. Like I'm not here to tell you how to act. <laughs> that is not my job. And I have to say like, I've had maybe one or two instances like that. I feel like you've probably had hundreds. I'm, I'm very good at boundaries. So people just don't ask me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and like, we don't leave space for it. And I think that's part of the teaching. I think part of the teaching is, is saying it's actually up to you to go um, curate the information, right? Go learn, go study, whether it's nonfiction, fiction, poetry, documentaries, podcasts, whatever it is, the news, like whatever it is. Um, and then you go figure out from everything that you're learning, what am I supposed to do here? Yeah. Um, because we, we can't, we can't do that. And like you said, um, earlier, this, we come in multitudes, uh, as, as black people, people of color, we come in multitudes. We all have different opinions. We all have, we, Kylie might advise one thing. I might advise another, another person might advise another. None of us is the authority on what it means to, 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 you know, show up in anti-racism, um, for each and every single person. But yeah, I, I imagine that's, um, a burden that oftentimes people want to put on you. And I'm so glad to hear that you give it right back. <laughs> Say that's not mine. Boundaries. That is not mine. I also just think that the second that I give into that responsibility, I take away from the enjoyment of storytelling. Mm. I don't. If you are reading my book thinking, okay, how do I do this? Oh my gosh. I had this woman DM me and she said, I'm really trying to learn. And I picked up your book and I saw that the white woman in it had divider plates for her child. And I said, okay, it's time to learn. So I threw my divider plates out. I was like, what? What? <laughs> Don't throw your plates away. <laughs> this is crazy. Like you can't just wow. think, well, the white woman's bad because of everything. Like that is, that's not a way to read wow. a book. So I think that when you were approaching black art, approach it as art and just say, let me yes. see how this affects me. Let me see how yeah. I feel on this page. Maybe I'll feel different on another page. Yeah. You know, maybe I'll be rooting for someone one time and not the other. I just yeah. let your experience it. it yeah. It's, uh, I love that you said, let, you know, let black art be art because I think so often it has to be more, right? There's this expectation that it should be more and therefore black artists don't have the space to be artists in the same way white artists may get to be artists. Oh, wow. um, with fellow black artists, how are you cultivating um, a community of, you know, let's honor our humanity. Let's not give in to the expectations placed on us. Right. You know, so, so much of it is just venting. <laughs> just like, coming together and saying, are yeah. you getting this? Are you getting this? Okay. How are you answering this question? Okay. Well, when you get this question, how do you do it? And then yeah. kind of doing what we were talking about with James Baldwin is taking certain things and saying, okay, how can I make that? Mm. Work? You know, I've talked to black artists about certain questions and, and certain questions that we won't be answering anymore. Yeah. You know, one of them for me earlier this year, when I got nominated for the Booker prize, which I was so excited about, I got asked, Oh, thank you. I got asked, um, how does it feel to be nominated, you know, to this prize that has a very strong tie to slavery and sugar selling and exploitation? Oh, wow. Wow. I don't think that I've ever heard a white writer. No. He asked how they feel to be accepting award from many corporations that are right. 
by slavery and exploitation. And so until I see other writers, white writers dealing with that history, I just don't think that I'm going to do the I, same. Yeah. And I just, for me, as soon as I hear someone say something, I try and do the same thing in my own words. And so I think that me and other black artists right now are just trying to come together and keep the art first and feed off of each other in a way that we're going to be able to be graceful and respectful, but also be able to go to sleep at night as well. Yes, that part. <laughs> so you, you talked about, um, uh, you, you've mentioned a couple of times that you, you teach uh, students. How, how, what age are the students that you teach? So I taught when I was at Iowa and it was undergrads and I loved it. So they were around 20 to 21, but they were students who were not trying to be writers. They were just trying to get their art credit and just like wanted to pass school, which I love that place uh -huh. of who are like, I'm bad at this. I don't read. And it's just like, okay, great. Let's, let's do this. Um, but then next, this coming spring, I'll teach a class in the MFA program at Temple, which will be wonderful. Uh, Cause Amira Temple, Amira Tucker in my novel went to Temple. So I'm so uh -huh. happy in there in the spring. Yeah. What do you love most about teaching? What does it give you that you don't necessarily get with writing? Oh my goodness. I, I think teaching one, I just, I love it. I just love the performative uh, aspect of it. I did get a BFA in drama in college. And so I'm glad that my degree is like going somewhere <laughs> to make it fun for students. I feel that the, the challenge for me to keep students interested in craft challenges me to uh, look at mediums a different way. So I use text, I use poems, music videos, television, commercials. I love being able to learn from different mediums. Um, but also I just love the progression of students learning that they have a voice in art. I don't believe that you have to have written a novel to have big opinions about it. And so I feel like my students come in saying, I don't know anything, I'm not good at this. And by the end they're like, you know, Kurt Vonnegut, no, he's dumb. I don't like him. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I love seeing those opinions on art grow and, and just seeing students who usually don't read realize that they have a space in art too. That part too. Mm. Is yeah. I love that. I love that so much. Um, so, uh, with your students knowing that you are a best selling <laughs> author, <laughs> Uh, nominated for the Booker Prize. I mean, does that ever get in the way of them being able to just fully absorb um, what you're teaching? You know, no, they they don't care. <laughs> they don't care. I love it. <laughs> uh, when I when I've had the opportunity to teach this year, which has been great, it's it's kind of this great humbling thing. Like they do not care. They're like, what do you have to offer me? And it challenges me, you know, to listen yeah. to them. Uh, I don't know if you feel this way too, but after coming off of the high of your book when you go back to students and when you go back to writing it is so humbling it is very way. humbling <laughs> it's very humbling it is very humbling and you're like this is trash like yes. why do I do this and so but it like brings back all of those things I love about writing is that it takes patience you have to treat it like doggedly and bring your hand gently back to the page yeah. and make it better and better and so I'm happy that students haven't cared yet because I think I need that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you brought this up though, because it it's so true that you come off of you you were in the cave writing the book, right? You you worked with your team to make it into the book that you want it to be, you publish it, and then you've got you you go from internal behind the scenes to suddenly splashed everywhere, um, doing many, many, many interviews and many, many, many features. And I think there comes a point where you start believing your own hype, right? And you forget, oh, like the process, the craft, like is, yeah. is grueling and it will demand from you and you need to put in the work. And so coming back to whether it's teaching or writing again, brings you back down to earth and reminds you, no, like this is, this is where the real work is that what I do afterwards talking about it is just the after effect, but this is where it really, really counts. The, the parts that you think about, oh, this is where writing happens. You think it's going to be the public parts, but it's the parts where you're by yourself and you're yeah. going over that sentence one more time or, or, you know, stressing out about a character's name or, or whatever it is. And it's hard to remember that when you're in the peak of things, but then you come back and, and writing will remind you very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> so what, before we close out um, and before I ask my final question, I have one more question, which is um, 
when I read this book, I was like, I want to read every other book that she writes from now on. Um, now on, yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> yes, from now on. Uh, not not the eight or nine that have been, which are now locked in a vault and will never see the light of day. Uh, but from now on, is there, a, is there a project that you're working on at the moment? Next book. Um, I am working on novel number two, which means a lot of reading for me and a lot of holding up interviews, which is, which is fuels me for sure. So I'm interviewing a lot of people right now and slowly working on that. Um, I don't see myself ever writing anything that doesn't dive into issues of class and cringy moments. And so I think there will be some more of those. And, and I just love writing about characters who identify as women as well. So I think that both of those will be making appearances. Um, but I'm also executive producing uh, the film adaptation of Such a Fun Age. Yes! Exciting, yeah. How did we not mention this? This is becoming oh, I, a film. Yes. At the same time, you know, everything is shut down because of yes. COVID right now. And so I have no idea what that means for the immediate future, but my team is lovely and I'm so excited to see what we can do with this on screen for sure. I love it. And it's Lena Waith that bought the mm -hmm. film option rights, right? We did. It's her Hillman grad network, as well as another team site and scene. And it just, it feels like everyone just has skin in the game in a really yeah. real way, which is really, really nice. Yeah. I saw that you are, you will be an executive producer on the movie. Yeah. Um, did you ever think that this would be something? <laughs> did you <Yeah>. ever dream? <laughs> Dreaming. I remember when I workshopped my novel, at Iowa, I was in the novel writing workshop. And so you turn in the whole thing and you just like pray and, and deep breathe. And I remember coming back and one of my girlfriends said to me, okay, I cast your whole book. Do you want to know who should play who? And so I thought, okay, maybe this has like a fun cinematic bend, but I yes. never thought real yeah. life. I think the goal for most fiction writers is let me write a book that is successful enough that I can do it again. That was the goal. Uh, so the fact that this is happening is wonderful because I really love film and I'm excited to see what we do. Oh, well, I'm so excited for you. I definitely saw it as a film when I was reading it. Um, was very excited to know that it is becoming a film. Cannot wait to watch it and can't wait to read more of your books as well. Kylie, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for this book, which was just such a delight <laughs> to read after my tour and is something that... Um, uh, I'm definitely recommending to people. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation as well and just hearing about all of these different dynamics of the characters, but also your journey as a writer. I know that there is so much more to come from you and I'm just going to be there on the sidelines cheering and asking for advanced copies of every book you read. <laughs> to have your eyes on this was really lovely and it's so nice it sounds crazy but it's really really nice to talk to another black writer about things like boundaries in a way that is hopeful and positive and showing all of you know the benefits of those things this has been really definitely lovely. thank you all right my love our final final question um what does it mean to you to be a good ancestor i thought mm. about this <laughs> this might sound crazy but when I thought about being a good ancestor, there was something I thought about all of my days of, of being a nanny with children that I, I became really, really close to. I do not like bugs at all. Like if I see a spider, I will scream. I don't want to see it. Like I just don't. And there was a weird loving feeling that I experienced when I was with children where I did not want them to see me be afraid of something and wow. loving a child I thought I don't want them to have the same setback that I have. And I'm going to use my love of this child to be brave in wow. this moment. And so I thought about for me, you know, being a good ancestor might be not passing on my fears and using my care for someone to, to be brave in those moments. And so a spider is a tiny example of that, but I'm sure <laughs> there are bigger, bigger ones where, you know, using your care for someone to not pass on your fears. That's fine. I love that. I love that so much. Thank you so much, Kylie. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. This is Leila Saad, and you've been listening to Good Ancestor Podcast. I hope this episode has helped you find deeper answers on what being a good ancestor means to you. We'd love to have you join the Good Ancestor Podcast family over on Patreon, where subscribers get early access to new episodes, patron-only content and discussions, and special bonuses. Join us now at patreon.com forward slash good ancestor podcast. 
Thank you for listening and thank you for being a good ancestor.